This is Longboard Technology, and today I'm going to be showing you how you can make your own rain wheels. So let's get started. So uncharacteristically, I'm just going to jump right in and make the wheels and show you how to do that. And then we'll talk about all the design details and all that fun stuff afterwards. So first thing you're going to need is some wheels to lathe. I've chosen this set here. Uh, these are some worn down flywheels. And these were the best complete set of wheels I could, I could throw together from this pile of scrap. Um, you're going to need a 3 8 inch bolt with two bushings and a nut. You're going to want a sharpie, some gloves, a drill, some way to hold down the trigger. So I'm going to be using a clamp. You could use like something like a zip tie. And you're going to want some round files. So uh, round files can be pretty cheap. I got this set here. These, these is a, a assortment of sizes. These are all good sizes for rain wheels. These are Harbor Freight chainsaw files. And this whole set was something like four bucks. So it's, they're really cheap and easy to get a hold of. The one thing is they do need to be sharp newish condition files. So I was just messing around with it and this is not super condition, but this, this uh, file worked. However, this older one, which has been bouncing around in a toolbox, uh, absolutely is not going to work with cutting for cutting the wheels. Uh, so they have to be newish files. First step is you're going to want to mark one of the wheels or all the wheels with a Sharpie. So I've, I'm going to do just three cuts and I used my calipers to just scratch a mark. And then I, I'm, and then I'm marking that with the Sharpie so I can see it uh, when I spin it up on the drill. And then you throw this together on the bolt. You take one of the bushings like that, stick it onto the wheel. Get the other bushing, do the same thing on the other side, and tighten this all down. Like that. And then this will be ready to go in the drill. Nice and tight. All right, so you could do this in, say, a drill press or a lathe, and that would be better. But I figured the tool that most people have access to is going to be the drill and the uh, vise. So it could be a corded drill, but cordless will be more convenient, and you'll see why in a second. And um, so what you're going to do is I'm having it stick out the left side of the drill, and I have it in reverse. And that way, the top of the wheel is coming towards me and pressure on the wheel will cause the uh, bolt or the nut to tighten instead of loosen. So if I have it in forward, it'll just come off, see? So I have it in reverse, so it doesn't do that. And how I'm gonna set it up in this vise is I'm gonna grab the motor body and I'm gonna be, I'm not gonna grab it super tight be pretty gentle with it. I don't want to crush anything or destroy the drill. So instead of relying on just the clamping force, you know, so this thing can move a little bit, but I'm bracing the bottom against the table. So I'm able to press down against the drill and not have it move without having to, to clamp down too hard. So now that I've got it in there, I'm going to use a pen. Just darken my lines a little bit and we should be ready to go. So uh, I'm gonna put the glove on my, on my right hand. So on the hand I've got the file in, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be holding the handle. The handle. For this other hand, I'm gonna be holding the file. And the file is gonna get really hot. And also, if something happens, this hand's over here and it's most likely to get caught in something. Probably won't, but um, 
But yeah, so glove on the hand that's touching the file. Uh, I've got a little face mask here. The dust from the polyurethane is not supposed to be toxic, but it's still not a good idea to breathe it in. So I'm putting this on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the uh, clamp on. Like that. And to stop the drill, I'm just going to be taking the battery out so I can just leave the clamp where it is. And that will allow you to use something like a zip tie that's easy to, or that's hard to take on and off. And so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be coming in here and I'm going to be holding this from both ends with both hands. I'm going to be very carefully starting each line. And uh, what's going to happen is as the file heats up from friction, it's going to start melting the polyurethane just enough so it can bite into it. And it's going to start peeling away. And I'm just going to be doing, I'm going to, I'm going to be going for about half the depth of the file. So I'm going to have half circle cuts. So let's go and, and get it done. Battery in. Looks pretty good. Um, I'm gonna have to do this last cut again in a minute. The, the file's just getting too hot. Um, it's getting toasty, toasty hot. Oh yeah. You see that? The oil from the glove is smoking when I touch the file. So the file's too hot. It, that's why it stopped cutting really well. Is you notice that started the powder sort of stopped coming off. So I'm gonna. Spray the file down and let's finish up. There we go. That's one wheel done. So the reason why I kept moving the file around and using different sides and different parts of it was so that I wasn't staying on the same spot and getting that spot really, really hot. By moving it around, I'm able to use the file longer. And also just the main thing is just starting slow. It's not going to track by itself uh, at all at first. So I'm bracing my right hand over here on the vise and my left arm is braced on my side. Uh, Cause it's not gonna track at all basically. And um, I'm just using the weight of my hands. I'm not pressing down with a lot of force um, it's, it's, it's literally just the weight of my hands, like that. Um, and then I'm switching between kind of hanging my thumb off of it and, and putting my whole palm on it, just based on uh, how much control I want uh, and how much it's tracking. So once it's kind of established, I'll just set my hand down on top, just because that's a little easier. And I think it'll probably be a little safer to have your hand up over things. So there we go, that's one wheel. So, so now that we know how to make the rain wheels, let's talk about them for a second. And specifically, the first thing I want to talk about is the files I had to use. I said to use round files. I didn't say use square files. I didn't say use a knife or whatever other stuff that people are out there trying to use. Uh, there's a, and there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, one of the first ones is files are a lot safer than some of the things people are trying to use. Uh, there's not a whole lot that can go wrong if you slip with a file. So that's one thing. But the more important thing for the design is that we want a rounded bottom for our groove. So there's a couple of advantages to this. 
Uh, one is these, uh, the alternative is a square bottom with square angles and parallel side walls. And a lot of wheels use that, and a lot of people that make wheels have that. So these are Harfang rain wheels, and they have square sides and square bottoms and square walls. And that's because of the way they make it is with a router bit as it's on the lathe, and they see and see everything. But you'll have wheels like this, which have square cutouts, and wheels like this, which also have square cutouts. And one of the big problems with the square cutouts is right here. If they're deep enough, they get these nasty, they, get, they, get, they catch rocks. And uh, it's, it's just super annoying. They're completely unhelpful for staying hooked up on the road, and they make a lot of clacking noises, and it's just annoying. So avoiding that is very nice. And the other thing is the corner of the contact area of the urethane. So this edge right here is unsupported. So it's like, it's like a lip, a square lip. And I think by having the cove, the area right here, in this area here, it's more supported by urethane at its base. Instead of just being, instead of just being flat, it's got all this extra material to the side, which is able to support it. So that means that this corner right here flexes a lot less than that corner right there will. And in my experience, that gives you a lot better performance out of the wheel for, for rain. So I actually ca caught on to that idea when I started riding and playing around with, with rain or shark wheels in the rain. And they ended up having these rounded, so these, have these rounded coves in them because these are cast. Because these are cast, that basically force them to, to design the wheel this way. And because these ones are CNC'd, it, I mean, it basically, they didn't force them to do it this way, but this was the easiest way for them to practically, to do it practically. So, uh, but we have a way to make coves practical for us. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna stick with coves. That's gonna, uh, that's going to give us better supported lips. It's going to not catch rocks because you can see if you put a rock in here, there's nothing to hold it in. It's just going to fall out. Boop. If you get a rock in here, it can wedge itself, you know, between these sides here and get stuck. So that's, that's all good. So another consideration with the rain wheels is how much water that they can displace. So how much room there is for water to fill up. So it's, it's easy to imagine in a wheel like this, we can have one big groove. Because as you're going along, the, the water can fill this groove. So water that's underneath the wheels can go and it can travel either this way or that way to either go into the groove here or go outside the wheel and get out from underneath the wheel. And that shortens the path that water has to travel to get out of the way. However, if there's too much water, this groove will just get filled up and they won't have anywhere for that water to go. So it'll have to start going all the way across the surface of the wheel again. And that's when you'll have problems staying uh, gripped up and hydroplaning and stuff like that. So the capacity of this groove is what you want to think about. So this has a pretty large capacity here. This thing has three grooves, but they're very small, and this doesn't have very large capacity at all. Uh, these shark wheels actually have a pretty good capacity, and the distance that the water has to travel is not very far because it's got the three grooves. So the water only has to travel like that far to get out of the way from any one spot. And the Harfang wheels, they're really good. They've got a big capacity because they've got quite a few grooves and they've even got these escape routes so that once it's in the groove, it, the groove cannot, can continue to fill up without overflowing as much. So uh, 
that's that's a, that's a consideration too. How much water you're going to want to deal with is going to dictate how many grooves you want and how big they are. Generally, you're going to, you're going to want to keep as much wheel as you can because the wheels are designed to work with the contact patch that they've got. And messing with that too much is going to is going to make the work the wheel work less well. And that's the last thing I want to talk about is the contact patch. So when I started, this wheel right here was 50 millimeters, which is basically the width. That's the contact patch. But I have taken away and carved out three channels that are about five, a little more than five millimeters each. So I basically reduced the wheel's contact patch by somewhere between like maybe like 18 millimeters. So that leaves me with a contact patch of around maybe 33. Which, if you look at that, that is a lot narrower of a wheel than the full width, right? We just compare it right there. That's a lot smaller of a wheel. So by removing that much material and that much contact patch, um, Basically, I don't want to get too much into it, but it changes the behavior of the wheel, and it makes it less grippy, and it, act, it makes it act softer. So you have to compensate for the amount of material you remove with the durometer of the wheel. So the Harfang wheel, it's 78A, which is pretty hard. So normally, if you're riding out in the cold, at the same temperature it's going to be when it's raining, you're probably going to want to have, a, you know, maybe not super soft wheels, but you're probably riding softer than 78A because th that, that material is going to be more flexible at that temperature, you know, all, all that stuff. But because you've reduced the contact area and the contact patch, the, you, the durometer you're going to want to use is going to be a little higher for that same cold condition. So that's, that, I think, is the, the last consideration. And there's, there's a lot I could go into that, but I, I think the crux of it is you're, as you remove contact area and contact patch, you're going to be wanting to use a wheel that's a little, a little harder, uh, just depending on how much you remove. So, whew. Right, so I think that's all the information you're going to need to make your own wheels. If not, we'll see. I'll see it when I go to edit. But to recap, I think it's... Uh, Cove grooves instead of square grooves. Uh, the number and size of the grooves, you're going to want to decide depending on how much rain and how much water you're going to be riding in and the wheels you have on the durometer of them. And uh, I think that's basically it. So yeah, there we go. I'm cutting it. We're stopping now. Longboard technology over and out.